Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. This evening, the president is calling his first defense secretary the world's most overrated general. That's a quote. Former four-star Marine General James Mattis has broken his silence. That's what brought about the president's response. Mattis has released a scathing critique of Trump just days after Monday night's federal show of force in order to clear protesters out of Lafayette Square, an order sent down by Attorney General Barr to allow the president's photo op holding a Bible aloft in front of the church with the burned out basement and the boarded up windows. Here is part of what General Mattis has written, quote, I have watched this week's unfolding events angry and appalled. When I joined the military some 50 years ago, I swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution. Never did I dream that troops taking that same oath would be ordered under any circumstance to violate the constitutional rights of their fellow citizens, much less to provide a bizarre photo op for the elected commander-in-chief with military leadership standing alongside. Mattis goes on to say, Donald Trump is the first president in my lifetime who does not try to unite the American people, does not even pretend to try. Instead, he tries to divide us. We are witnessing the consequences of three years without mature leadership. Well, as you might imagine, that's going to leave a mark. In an interview with his first press secretary, the president defended the decision to go to the church and his threat to use the military to put down the protests. We have very strong powers to do it. Uh, the National Guard is, is customary, and we have a very powerful National Guard, uh, over 300,000 men and women, and we can do pretty much whatever we want. Why didn't you go to St. John's the other day? I went there because somebody suggested it was a good idea, and I thought it was a great idea. I think everything was handled very well. I will tell you, religious leaders loved it. Religious leaders thought it was great. They loved it. He was asked tonight if the nation needs healing. He answered, the nation needs law and order. In an earlier interview, Trump was asked about reports he had taken shelter in the White House bunker Friday night as hundreds demonstrated outside the executive mansion. It was a false report. Uh, I wasn't down. I went down uh, during the day, and I was there for a tiny, little short period of time, and it was much more for an inspection. There was never a problem. We never had a problem. No, nobody ever uh, came close to giving us a problem. They said it would be a good time to go down, take a look, because maybe sometime you're going to need it. Despite the president's claim that he was merely inspecting the bunker, as one does tonight, the Washington Post indeed reports Trump and the first lady and their son, Barron, were rushed to the secure space Friday night after a few protesters jumped over barricades, coming within about 350 feet of the east wing. We also heard from a previous White House occupant today. Former President Barack Obama made his first public remarks about the protest, offering his support for those demanding police reform. I am urging every mayor in this country to review your use of force policies with members of your community and commit 
to report on planned reforms. There is something different here. You look at those protests, and that was a far more representative cross-section of America out on the streets, peacefully protesting, and who felt moved to do something because of the injustices that they had seen. That didn't exist back in the 1960s, that kind of broad coalition. Here to help us make sense of another consequential day in our country, longtime friend of this broadcast, Kimberly Atkins, senior Washington correspondent for WBUR, Boston's NPR news station. Uh, Kim, two points. Number one, no one who's been paying attention can uh, uh, argue with that point about the diversity of these crowds. That's one of the points that comes through to even a casual observer, loud and clear. Number two... Mattis uh, and Obama in what must have been a triggering day for this president. Yes, I mean, it really uh, makes a very clear difference. You can see the difference in the handling of protests like this, protests based on anger uh, over the killing of unarmed black people, the way it was handled under the Obama administration and the way that it was handled under the Trump administration laid bare. You see Donald Trump, someone who has always reveled in the power of military might. Uh, one of the first things Donald Trump did recall was when he was elected was to reverse a policy implemented by the Obama Im- administration that stopped the uh, donation of surplus military equipment to local police forces. And the reason that the Obama administration stopped that was after Ferguson. Recall after that the protests in Ferguson, Missouri were met by a militaristic uh, police force and that just exploded uh, the, the controversy. Uh, and the pain in that situation, and they sought to avoid that. The president put that right back. He said that the p- local police need military might and that it would be useful for them. So since the beginning, there has been this stark difference where when the president, when President Trump sees a threat, he likes to bolster his military might. Certainly this report that he went into a bunker seemed to uh, really... Uh, m- embarrass him, frankly, uh, and made that uh, even even greater. And you see President Obama instead saying, look, I gave a playbook on what to do and going around President Trump, essentially talking directly to uh, municipalities, saying implement some of these uh, some of these suggestions, some of these plans and proposals that I laid out five years ago and report back and see how that works. So it it really is a stark, stark difference, both in style and substance from the current president and his predecessor. Also, Kim, it's the esteem and regard that the American people have for uh, these two guys specifically. Yesterday it was Admiral Mullen, uh, but today uh, Jim Mattis, uh, as revered as he is across the river in the Pentagon, Barack Obama, who along with his wife, the former first lady, has risen in public esteem since leaving two terms in office. That's absolutely right. I mean, in general, Mattis, you have someone uh, who has long been respected, uh, not only in the Pentagon and throughout the military community, but beyond. This isn't the first time he spoke out against the president, of course, in his resignation letter. uh, He said that he did not share the same vision with the president, that he believed in building, uh, that General Mattis believed in building uh, coalitions with our allies and supporting them. uh, And that's something that the president didn't. It took the president a day or so to realize that dig. And ever since then, uh, the president has falsely claimed that he uh, essentially fired Mattis rather than uh, he resigning. But the these words today, uh, coupled with the words of the current uh, defense secretary, uh, Secretary Esper, before he walked it back a little bit, saying that he did not agree with the decision to disperse the crowd before the White House, uh, before the president walked to St. John's Church. Uh, he then called off military, active duty military in Washington, D.C., a decision that he reversed a few hours later. So there are still that there are still those active duty uh, military 
military folks in here in the nation's capital. But there was there's been pushback within this community that is frustrated that the military is being called upon to treat American citizens as as combatants, uh, essentially, and, and to police them on U.S. soil, something that goes against the law uh, and and it goes against the spirit of the Constitution. Uh, and so, yes, you see that pushback. That's something that did not happen at all during the Obama administration. It is Thursday, the 4th of June of 2020, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Well, the uh, pandemic continues unabated. Uh, Trump hasn't really given up on it. He's just allowing it to do its work. The more people who die, the less people who vote. Because the more people who vote won't be voting for him. And he already knows that. And they are trying everything they can to make sure that if a vote is actually allowed in November, that very few people, well, let's just put it this way, only the good Christians can vote. And only the good Christians are the ones that like Trump. Everybody else are bad Christians. So we have civic unrest during a pandemic, an election coming up, and uh, police unions pretty much saying, ah, Joe Biden's pissing us off. Well, you know what? The police unions are pissing me off, and I think they pretty much piss off most of America once they find out how corrupt they are. Look, if we're going to take down the head of the Teamsters and all of the underlings have been involved in corrupt practices like being mobbed up then I would presume police unions would be under the same aegis. And they need to be disbanded, their leadership thrown in jail. Indeed. Yeah. Joe Biden is pissing off the police union uh, presidents. Well, you know what? You piss us off. A lot of bullies going on there, you know. It's true. So uh, the police are rioting because they refuse to have any oversight, civilian or otherwise. Military contractors have been hired to shoot and fire upon American citizens. Guards from uh, the prisons are out to bust heads because, you know, they have a lot of practice doing that, also in confined spaces. They're really good in confined spaces. So we got all of that going on, a militarized constabulary. What could go wrong? Yeah, we were, we are seeing it. People say that we are in the death throes of democracy, the last steps in the death throes of democracy. I say that actually uh, we are in the final stages of a Trump presidency in which he will be going to jail and so will his Vichy collaborators. A Truth and Reconciliation Commission? No. We're talking prosecutions, and I propose a tribunal in Nuremberg. Nuremberg, Pennsylvania. You know, for the optics. We're a TV nation. Let's put this show on in Nuremberg, Pennsylvania. Mm Mm-hmm. And we're going to air this dirt, and we're going to find out who the good Germans were. Look it up. My my sous chef is snoozing away. I love him so, so I just let him do it. Okay, I apologize, but he's there. Well, um, there's so much more going on, of course. Uh, The economy is tanking. It looks like uh, almost 1.9, you could say 2 million people, have become unemployed since just last month. And they were expecting about a million less. Oops. Yeah. Well, you know, he's making American carnage again. Whatever that is, maca? Ooh, that might have a kind of connotation. Well, we'll throw it back in their face, won't we? You have to look that one up, too. Uh, Bill Barr has his own. Well, I mentioned the prison guards. That's Bill Barr's Praetorian guards. 
he's able to mobilize and activate a militarized force under his leadership, the Attorney General. Have you ever heard of that before? No, you haven't, because it's never happened before. And if it does, then that means this guy needs to be John Mitchell to Nuremberg, Pennsylvania, too. Leavenworth in a lockup in solitary. This is what I propose. Every single one of these serve a term in solitary at Leavenworth, and then they get blindfolded and thrown in Guantanamo for the rest of their days listening to Ted Nugent's catch cat scratch fever blaring on the loudspeakers 23 hours a day because I'm a humanitarian. They can have an hour off a day. That is what I propose. I mean, the facilities are already built. Let's use them. Let's put them into use in which they should be used. And since apparently we can't send anybody to The Hague, which I think that we still can, because if rules can be changed, rules can be changed, right? If we decided at some point not to be signatories to the Geneva Convention so we can use tear gas on American citizens when you can't use it anywhere else in the world because it's a war crime... Well, I don't know. Maybe we need to sign on to that again. I say that anybody who commits a war crime in our United States, who is a United States citizen or otherwise, gets tried at The Hague after they serve a term in a federal lockup. Now, that's the justice I propose, indeed. Well, what's on the rest of the menu here? And, of course, at the top, uh, both Obama and Mattis, in strong rebukes to Trump, support the protesters. Because this is America, not Russia. All right? Let's not forget that. On the rest of the menu, everybody remembers Winston Churchill using his Tommy Boys to bludgeon mothers, children, the elderly, and clergy out of London bomb shelters so he could hold up a self-autographed copy of his Boer War history. Yeah, that's how much Trump is just like Winston Churchill. And the press secretary will insist that you believe it. You better. Trump used his White House address to register to vote in Florida, so you can imagine what he's done with his Russian addresses. Yeah, he's got a lot. And U.S. Park Police are investigating two officers after video showed two Australian journalists being attacked during the protests. In Washington, D.C. Yeah, you don't beat up the world press. That's going to get you in even more trouble. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Israeli parliament sessions have been suspended after a lawmaker contracted COVID while schools shudder over fresh outbreaks. A harbinger of what's going to happen here. Hmm? And the head of Brazil's top electoral court will hear cases next week seeking to invalidate Bolsonaro's 2018 election. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is our chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is our link to our Patreon page. And I know times are tough and some of you have had to pull back on your recurring contributions and that's okay. Uh, we are paying our bills, but uh, if there are those of you out there who are able to afford, say, an espresso-type coffee drink, when we could go and get that with impunity. Remember those days? If you could afford that uh, and send those funds to us once a month, uh, we're able to stretch those dollars because we have vast experience in doing so. Almost 10 years experience at 24-7, 365 
Continuous Resistance Broadcasting. That's right. That's what we do. And we're the little powerhouse of resistance that could, and we are. And we are able to do so because of your generosity over all these many years. Thank you. If you would like to follow uh, the show on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that platform, and we are forever indebted to Tom for doing that. And he and Kelly do so much more than just monitor and take care of platforms. Okay, thank you. I take care of at Justice Putnam on Twitter. Follow me there because I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that linked up uh, up on social media, which Twitter is one of those you know social media things there. I put it there. If you would like to follow the show on Twitter, do so at Cookbook West. And do please pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I know that if you look for podcasts on et cetera, you may or may not find them there. But they're mostly everywhere. Mostly. All right, we better dive into this first offering about how much Trump is just like Churchill. My God, the gall of these people. You know what else also makes me a little angry this morning? Are these little... Trump bootlicking kids who have, I don't know, they've barely been able to, you know, lick Trump's boots for, you know, even, I don't know, a few years of their lives, which hasn't been very much, taking on a four-star general and trashing him. God, uh, Lord of the Lies. Yeah, that's the island that they're going to be surviving on. I can tell. Oliver Willis penned this first piece, and he, of course, writes for the American Independent. Yesterday, Wednesday, White House Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany compared Donald Trump's photo op with a Bible to the actions of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill during World War II. Yeah, we all remember what he did then. He was able to use his Tommy Boys. What's a Tommy Boy? I don't know. I kind of like the term. You can imagine. But, you know, some sort of military or paramilitary unit to clear out London bomb shelters so he could have a photo op. Winston did that? Huh. Now, McEnany specifically compared Trump's three-minute appearance outside a church after protesters were tear-gassed to clear the site for him to Churchill inspecting sites of bomb damage during the London Blitz that killed tens of thousands of civilians. I think that maybe the, the photo op is less akin to Winston Churchill and more akin to the Nazis bombing London during the Blitz. She also compared Trump's brief performance with previous presidential actions, actions like Bush's throwing out the first pitch after 9-11. Gee, well, we've already seen what Trump looks like throwing a baseball. McEnany praised the purported symbolism of Trump's photo op, but just two days earlier she said... Trump did not need to take the symbolic action of making an Oval Office address to discuss the protest because he's really bad at it. So he decided to take the symbolic uh, action of uh, forcibly clearing out moms, kids, the elderly and the clergy in front of St. John's Church. He's so good at that. You sometimes wonder if it's the Nazi in him. Singer of the American Independent brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. In September of 2019, just as he was changing his domicile of record from New York to Florida, Trump filled out a voter registration form in his new state in which he stated that his legal residence was 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest in Washington, D.C., Registering to vote in Florida using an out-of-state ad address is a violation of Florida law, the Washington Post noted. Trump also listed his mailing address as his Mar-a-Lago resort in Palm Beach, 
directing that election-related mailings should be sent to him there, courtesy of Sean McCabe. McCabe, the president and general manager of Trump Florida Property, spells his first name Sean, S-H-A-W-N, and Trump misspelled the name S-E-A-N, which is also a violation of the law, and one that the GOP has been trying to criminalize for years. Boy, they always project, don't they? A month later, Trump filed a new registration application, changing the legal residence to Mar-a-Lago. He voted absentee in Florida in the state's March 2020 primary. Mark Elias, a lawyer specializing in elections and voting, uh, said in response to the Post report, it is looking more and more like Trump may have committed absentee ballot fraud in Florida. But Bill Barr has an OLC memo that says, hey, if Trump wants to commit, commit election fraud and voter fraud, he can do it because he's the president and the president is a bigger star than God. Don't you forget it. Uh, Florida voter registration form carries a criminal offense warning that states it is a third degree felony to submit false information. Maximum penalties are are $5,000 and or five years in prison. I would say charge them both. Republicans have for years falsely claimed voter fraud is a widespread problem in the U.S. It is not, according to experts who study the issue, but what do experts know? Republican-controlled legislatures have passed strict voter identification laws that they claim are intended to prevent voter fraud, but that voting rights advocates say ultimately disenfranchise minority voters. Now, Trump's official state of residence has been an issue since he first changed it from New York to Florida. He listed Mar-a-Lago as his permanent residence for tax purposes, even though in 1993 he vowed he would not live there and instead designated the mansion as a private club, according to the Washington Post. Disputes over the legal and tax ramifications of that promise and of his current designation of Mar-a-Lago as his legal residence, continue in Palm Beach. Worker bees of the Associated Press bring us this final offering here at the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The U.S. Park Police said it has placed two officers on administrative leave after video showed two Australian journalists being attacked during Monday night's protest in Washington, D.C. Video captured by WJLA-TV in Washington showed reporter Amanda Brace and cameraman Tim Myers being assaulted as law enforcement officials cleared an area near the White House so Trump could walk to a nearby church that had been damaged during the, the demonstrations the previous night. Actually, it wasn't really damaged. They had a small fire in the basement, and it was no big deal, according to the clergy at St. John's. But I digress. The journalists were, were reporting live for Australia's Channel 7 on the demonstrations protesting George Floyd's death at police hands in Minnesota. As is consistent with our established practices and procedures, two U.S. Park police officers have been assigned to administrative duties while an investigation takes place regarding the incident with the Australian press. Monaghan said in a statement posted on Twitter, 
Australia's ambassador to the U.S. has complained about the attack that the network's news director, Greg McPherson, described as nothing short of wanton thuggery. Well, that explains the police in America pretty well, don't you think? I'd like to have some thuggery on the Barbie. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison urged Australians involved in Floyd-related anti-racism protests around the world to be extremely cautious after attacks on Australian journalists in Washington and on Wednesday in London. In terms of the violence that we're seeing around the world today, for those Australians who find themselves in those situations, I would urge them to show great caution, Morrison told reporters. These are dangerous situations. People should exercise great care in where they're placing themselves, he added, especially when near the American police. All right, that brings us to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. You can tell a lot about people's general state of mind based on their social media feeds. Are they always tweeting about their biggest peeves or posting pics of particularly cute kitties? Well, in a similar fashion, researchers are turning to Twitter for clues about the overall happiness of entire geographic communities. What they're finding is that regional variation in the use of common phrases produces predictions that don't always reflect the local state of well-being. But removing from their analyses just three specific terms, good, love, and LOL, greatly improves the accuracy of the methods. We're living in a crazy COVID-19 era, and now more than ever, we're using social media to adapt to our new normal and reach out to the friends and family that we can't meet face-to-face. Kokil Judka studies computational linguistics at the National University of Singapore. But our words aren't useful just to understand what we as individuals think and feel. They're also useful clues about the community we live in. One of the simpler methods that many scientists use to parse the data involves correlating words with positive or negative emotions. But when those tallies are compared with phone surveys that assess regional well-being, Jedka says they don't paint an accurate picture of the local zeitgeist. To find out why, Jedka and her colleague Johannes Eichstedt of Stanford University analyzed billions of tweets from around the United States, and they found that among the most frequently used terms on Twitter are LOL, love, and good. And they actually throw the analysis off. In fact, when we removed these three words alone, we managed to improve upon the simpler word counting methods and obtain better, if not perfect, estimates of happiness. Why the disconnect? Well, Jetka says one issue is... Internet language is really a different beast than regular spoken or written language. We've adapted words from the English vocabulary to mean different things in different situations. Take, for example, LOL. I've tweeted the word LOL to flirt, express irony, annoyance, and sometimes just pure surprise. When the methods for measuring LOL as a marker of happiness were created in the 1990s, it still meant laughing out loud. (laughs) Well, there are plenty of terms that are less misleading, says Eichstedt. Our models tell us that words like excited, fun, great, opportunity, interesting, fantastic, um, those are better words for uh, measuring subjective well-being, Um, just looking at the data. Their work appears in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Being able to get an accurate read on the mood of the population is no laughing matter. And this is particularly important now in the time of COVID, where um, we're expecting a mental health crisis. And we're already seeing in survey data the largest diminishment in subjective well-being in 10 years at least, if not ever. 
No doubt we could all use more fantastic opportunities for great fun and excitement. Give or take the LOL. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Nemhauser, filling in for your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. As the U.S. population ages, more people are at risk for injuries. The largest percentage of injury-related deaths among this group are caused by falls. Elizabeth Burns is with CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. She's joining us today to discuss ways to prevent injuries and deaths from falls among senior adults. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Elizabeth, what are some of the more common consequences when a senior adult falls? Well, first, it's important to note that falls are incredibly common. More than one in four older adults will fall in a given year. Common consequences include loss of independence and an increased fear of falling as older adults are afraid to do the same kinds of activities they were doing before. And this can actually lead to more falls as older adults have less strength than their lower body. Common consequences include hip fracture and traumatic brain injury. And ultimately, in 2016, almost 30,000 older adults died because of a fall. So are falls more common in men or in women? Falls are more common in women and more women go to the emergency department because of a fall, and more women die because of a fall. However, the rate of fall deaths are more common in men than women. What this means is that out of 100,000 men, more will die from a fall than out of 100,000 women. What are common causes of falls among older people? Getting on and off the toilet and getting in and out of bed are common causes of falls. Walking around the hallways at night when the lights are off is a common way people fall. There's also an increased amount of medications used in seniors, which have side effects like making them lightheaded, and that increases the risk of falls and is a common cause. With all of those factors, what are some ways our listeners can decrease their chances of falling? Older adults should talk to their health care provider or doctor about how they can decrease their chances of falling. This can be done during the annual wellness visit or during annual physicals. The doctor will recommend an exercise program that should increase strength and balance or maybe refer you to a physical therapist. Additionally, they can look through your medications and perhaps reduce your doses or suggest medications that decrease your chances of falls. Are there things we can do to modify our homes to prevent falling? Oh, absolutely. Installing grab bars on the side of the toilet, making sure that rugs are taped down or removed, making sure that there's lighting in the hallways are all really simple ways that an older adult can modify their home to prevent falls. Where can listeners go to get more information about preventing falls? Listeners can go to cdc.gov slash study, and that's spelled S-T-E-A-D-I. Thanks, Elizabeth. I've been talking today with Elizabeth Burns about ways to prevent fall-related injuries and deaths among senior adults. Improving strength and agility through regular exercise and removing potential obstacles in the home can help decrease the risk for falls. If you or a loved one is older and struggle with mobility, talk with a health care provider about ways to decrease the risks for fall-related injuries and death. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Jeffrey Nemhauser for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. He seems sorry. We very clearly told him not to look up there. I'm honestly impressed that he was able to do it. Right? What, did he balance on that big chair? Or... Yeah, I mean, I guess he'll just know what his gifts are this year. I really thought we had hidden them well. If they can find their presence, they can find a gun. 911, what is your emergency? Every day, eight kids and teens are unintentionally killed or injured by loaded and unlocked guns. Learn how to make your home safer at nfamilyfire.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and N Family Fire. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. 
And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our Secure Donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution, and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots Radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. The 13th Amendment, ratified in December 1865, outlawed slavery or involuntary servitude throughout the United States and its territories, thereby finishing the work begun by President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of 1862-63. to The Emancipation Proclamation abolished slavery in the states that were members of the Confederacy, but not elsewhere. The 13th Amendment said nothing about citizenship and equal civil rights for the former slaves, especially their right to vote. These matters were later taken up by the 14th Amendment in 1868 and the 15th Amendment in 1870. The 14th Amendment granted full citizenship to African Americans. The 15th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote to men regardless of their race, color, or previous condition of servitude. That's all for today's podcast. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. To His Excellency the Governor, from the ACLU, Ray, the 2020 elections and the coronavirus pandemic. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. The April 22nd letter to Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker and other high state officials begins with two undeniable propositions, that voting is a fundamental right and that the coronavirus pandemic should not be allowed to compromise that right. The letter commends the Secretary of the Commonwealth, who oversees elections, for having concluded that a voter qualifies for an absentee ballot if the voter is ill or quarantined or staying at home or avoiding a polling place as a precautionary measure, and then highlights other necessary steps, including robust education and funding to ensure that widespread voting by mail takes place, which will require, among other things, the printing and distribution with postage prepaid return envelopes of absentee and early voting ballots in a number of languages. The state should also expand early voting from the present 11 days before an election to 20 or 30. For those who will need to vote at polls on Election Day, a sufficient number of polling places is vital because enough polling places in appropriate locations, along with mail-in and early and absentee voting, will shorten lines, allow greater physical distancing, and help protect poll workers and voters alike, all of which is critical at this time to the preservation of democracy. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1904. That was the day when 900 Wisconsin papermakers walked off the job from Appleton to Menasha from Combined Lakes to Nina. They were members of the International Brotherhood of Papermakers. At the turn of the 20th century, paper mills were an important industry in Wisconsin. The workers in these mills toiled long hours under grueling and dangerous conditions. According to historian Robert Azone, quote, many had fingers cut off, arms burned, and bodies mangled by the open machinery and the hot rolls and felts in the mills. The workers started organizing into unions and conducting work actions, but they had little success bargaining with the mill owners. In the Wisconsin River Valley, the workers on the night shift were especially frustrated about having to work on Saturday nights. They wanted a reduction in hours and an end to the Saturday night requirement. And on this day in labor history, the union called for a strike to begin that Saturday evening at 6 p.m. Mill owners scrambled to find local mill workers willing to scab against the strike. But they had little luck. The strike began and the workers walked off the job at 11 mills. 
For 10 days, things for the workers went well, and the strike was peaceful. Then the mill owners brought in replacement workers from out east. Skirmishes broke out between the scabs and the strikers. The scab replacement workers had taken away the leverage that the striking workers had had against the mill owners. Some of the strikers began to return to the mills, and the strike was defeated. Within three years, the Brotherhood of Papermakers would close its last lodge in Wisconsin, but worker organizing within the paper industry would continue forward. Labor History in Two, brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. I like the launch This is about the very survival of the human race. That is Sharon Burr, the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. The ITUC is the organization which represents national union centers such as the Ghana Trades Union Congress at the world level. The Confederation is calling on unions to participate in a World Day of Action to Combat Climate Change on June 24th. CEPOW, Climate and Employment Proof Our Workplaces, June 24th. Join the greatest conversation we've had on these issues. Recovery, resilience, we need a new social contract. The social contract has broken. We already had a convergence of crisis. Inequality was at historic highs. We know the labour income share or wages and social protection had slumped for working people and their families everywhere. Job insecurity. But we also had climate emergency. This is about the very survival of the human race. And progress for women on every indicator had stalled. We were also dealing with not just the demand for just transition for climate, and employment, but indeed for technology, because we face choices about the best and worst of technology. So as we indeed recover from the health crisis of COVID-19, as we invest in our public services, so never again do we underfund public health, we have to also grow jobs. We are facing the greatest employment devastation since the 1930s depression, could be three times as high as that. So we will start to talk about the new social contract that will be able to see us have hope in recovery and resilience. So the time we have the next crisis, whatever that looks like, we know that our workplaces are indeed employment and climate proof. So on June 24, invite your employer to sit down with you at the table, if you can, or virtually, and talk about what your plans are for protecting jobs, for increasing jobs, for building, indeed, a future that is secure. We can't go back to business as usual. Climate and employment proof our workplaces. It will be the largest conversation we've ever engaged around the world in every workplace where you take part. We're also, of course, inviting you to make a small video to let us know that you support the action and to invite other colleagues and friends, just two colleagues or friends, to join and do the same. It's in our hands to demand that we build recovery and resilience, that we deal with all the areas of crisis that are breaking down the security of our world of work. And we do it in order to see that the fight for a new social contract is realised, that just transition for all these areas of crisis and social dialogue sit at the heart of recovery with a resilience that means we're ready for whatever global shock comes after that. We are facing massive global shifts Just transitions are critical. COVID-19 has exposed all of them and we will be at the heart of demanding a new social contract for recovery, for resilience. Thank you. Solidarity. Hashtag C-E-P-O-W. Kapow. 
And that's it. International labor news you can use. You can listen to our features and daily newscasts at radiolabor.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Labor. I'm Mark Boulanger. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about caring for each other through global solidarity. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 59 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of around 80 or so, a little cooler than yesterday, but still, I think, quite nice. We will have sunny conditions throughout the day. Uh, winds will be out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Overnight lows in the mid-50s with a few passing clouds. And the winds will be out of the northwest at 5 to, to 10 miles per hour. Tomorrow we will get even cooler, a mid-70s it looks like, maybe a bit warmer. Partly cloudy skies in the morning will give way to cloudy skies during the afternoon with a slight chance of a rain shower. And winds will be out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then on the weekend, we're expecting to have a bit of rain. Oh, boy. The uh, confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County of Southern Oregon has increased now to 68. Every day it's been increasing. Wow. I wonder if it's any coincidence when people decided to violate social distancing and wearing of masks in mass numbers. I wonder. Let's see. Oh, pollen. I believe it's our grass pollen. Yes, indeed, is rated very high right outside the window of the mothership. The air quality index in the region is good at 25 parts per million. And the daytime UV index is very high at 8. Slather on the SP30 or greater. SP50. Put the, put the 50 on. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.05 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles and relative humidity is at 77 percent weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased these people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property and these people positively live around the world london is 60 degrees and partly cloudy with coronavirus Paris is 60 degrees and cloudy with coronavirus. Rome is 76 and fair with wind and coronavirus. Kiev is 63 and partly cloudy with coronavirus. Kabul is 78, fair with wind and coronavirus. Hong Kong is 81, partly cloudy with coronavirus. And uh, celebrating Tiananmen Square, if you call that a celebration. Tokyo is 74, partly cloudy with coronavirus. Sydney, Australia is 50 degrees and clear, and they're getting spikes of coronavirus. San Francisco, California is 58 degrees and sunny with coronavirus. And New York, New York is 80 degrees sunny with civil unrest and coronavirus. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. An 
Anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this first uh, moose bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Israel's parliament suspended sessions scheduled for today after a lawmaker tested positive for the coronavirus. While some schools shut down anew amid worries about fresh outbreaks. Having moved aggressively against the global pandemic in March and seeing a trailing off of new cases, Israel has eased curbs in recent weeks, but officials warn that public complacency could lead to a resurgence in cases. Oh my. The 120 seat Knesset said non essential staff have been asked to stay home. And all of today's committee meetings were postponed, quote, pending an investigation of the ramifications, end quote, of lawmaker Sami Abu Shadeh's having contracted the coronavirus. I appeal to all of those who have been in my immediate vicinity to self-isolate and get tested, he said on Twitter. The virus is still among us, and a return to so-called routine helps the virus spread with greater magnitude and speed. It's a warning to us, too, folks. Please. Israeli schools reopened last month, but worries have grown that some children are infecting others despite a slew of precautionary measures. Israeli media reported on Thursday today that as many as 42 schools had closed over fresh outbreaks. The education ministry did not immediately confirm the figure. Any educational system in which there is morbidity will be shut. Benny, Benjamin Netanyahu, I think they call him Benjamin Netanyahu, said in a statement, adding that school staff would continue seeking ways to protect and distance students from one another. Israel, which has a population of 9 million, has reported 17,343 coronavirus cases and 290 deaths. More than 593,000 people in the country have been tested for the virus. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles rester Toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. The ever-present anonymous worker bee at Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The head of Brazil's top electoral court will, will hear arguments on Tuesday of next week related to two cases seeking to nullify the 2018 presidential election which was won by current President Bolsonaro, the court said in a statement yesterday, Wednesday. The cases, which have moved in fits and starts since November, were brought by leftist election rivals Marina Silva and Gilham Boulos and relate to cyber attacks committed against Bolsonaro's campaign rivals. This might be a difficult case in which to prevail in, but it may also lay bare maybe uh, some of the private contractors that have been contracting around the world for similar results. Similarly. That brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on, and we're going to meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speaking. Bon appétit.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théâtres Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui courent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Les années passent Qu'il est loin, là je tombe Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 